All right, well, uh, a warm hello uh, and welcome to The Power of Our Stories, a virtual panel brought to you by the New Krakow Friendship Society, also known as NCFS. I'm Bonnie Cantor, and I have the privilege of welcoming you and serving on the board of this extraordinary organization started by Holocaust survivors. We uh, can look at racism and bigotry from two perspectives. Um, data opens our eyes, personal stories open our hearts and helps us make sense of the data, which leads to compassion and empathy. Uh, let's see what the numbers say. In 2019, Edwards, Lee and Esposito published an article in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they found that black males are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than white males. And that dying at the hands of law enforcement is the leading cause of death among young black men. Another data point, in May of 2020, the Anti-Defamation League reported more than 2,100 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States, a 12% jump and in the most in any year since it's be it began tracking over four decades ago. Before we move to our panel, we'd like to know you, the audience, a little bit better to the extent that we can in a virtual experience. So we're going to do a quick polling. Uh, please respond to the questions. You can do it on your screen, on your phone. Have you experienced and or witnessed bigotry or racism in your lifetime? Never. I don't think it was outright hate. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. Yes, but not recently. Occasionally, too many to count. We'll give it a few more moments here. Okay. Still, we've got still people polling in, thank you. All right, well, uh, the numbers don't shock me here. Um, unfortunately, um, we've got a lot of yes, occasionally too many to count. Uh, racism is everywhere and none of us are immune. So at this point, let me introduce you to um, my partner, uh, uh, my fellow board member, Anna Schumann, Gallegos, uh, and uh, she's going to take you through and introduce the panelists. Uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll touch base later. <laughs> thank you, Bonnie. Uh, statistics give us a great jumping off point, but now it's important we go beyond the numbers and we get to know individual people and their experiences. As an organization founded by Holocaust survivors from Krakow, Poland and Polish Galicia, the members of the new Krakow Friendship Society know all too well the different forms of ignorance, hate and bigotry. It is from our survivors that we learn the immeasurable value of retelling. It turns the statistic into a human. And that brings us to today. So let's meet our accomplished panel. We have Yair Rosenberg, American journalist and senior writer at Tablet Magazine, a regular speaker and commentator on anti-Semitism in the modern era, with a focus on combating abuse on online platforms. His writing credits include the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Guardian, and The Wall Street Journal. Now let's meet our panelists. We have Leota Sanders, who is the chief of the Office of Civil Rights for New Jersey Transit. Uh, Leota serves as both Chief Civil Rights Officer and Chief Diversity Officer, supervising four distinct business units. And we also have Leora Klein, who is a founding and board member of 3GNY, which is an organization for and by grandchildren of survivors of the Holocaust. Leora also ran their We Do, We Educate Holocaust Speaker Education Program for five years. Okay, Yair? Take it away. Hello. It's great to be with you all here tonight. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'll be frank, I did not expect us to have like 80 people here, um, which is a remarkable thing because 
you know, I try to go and talk to people about anti-Semitism and, you know, they run in the other direction. Uh, so I think we all really appreciate you coming here to have this really important conversation with us and hear these stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the, the groundwork has been laid. I think you understand what this is about. Uh, one thing I'll add as a little bit of uh, prelude to understand uh, New Krakow and the idea behind this event is that uh, everyone involved here believes that one of the ways we can, can best convey um, issues involving anti-Semitism and racism is not necessarily through PowerPoint presentations or statistics uh, or the, uh, the sort of uh, opinion writing that someone like me might usually engage in, but rather through stories, uh, through human experiences. Um, and so that's gonna be my first question to our panelists, which will hopefully give you a sense of who they are um, and why they're here. Um, and that question is, um, what personal story uh, brought you to this work? Uh, that you, you that has led you uh, to engage in education against uh, racism and anti-Semitism, against prejudice. Um, and I guess we'll start with uh, Leotis, if that's okay. Sure, that's fine. Thank you, Yeo. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you uh, for having me on this panel. Uh, it's really always a pleasure to engage in this conversation. I should say, as I tell my personal story, that I'm here in my personal capacity, so I'm not here as an official representative of New Jersey Transit. Um, so while I certainly incorporate who I am and the work that I do, I can answer questions about buses or trains in the chat. But in terms of personal story, um, I always go back to this moment when um, I was 11 or 12 years old in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, which at that time was about 85% Italian American. We were the only black family in Brooklyn that I have ever known about living in my area at that time. And I'm walking home from junior high school. This is about the mid eighties age. And um, I have walking with two of my Italian American friends to the place where we all live. We all live within about a block of each other. And as I'm getting close to the point where we all diverge, I notice coming down the street, there's a gentleman driving a bread truck. And I noticed him, but I didn't pay attention. And I didn't until he screeched his tires and stopped right directly uh, in front of us. And he starts shouting, and I'm gonna use the N word here, so just prepare yourself. He takes a crowbar and he starts banging it against the side of his truck saying, what are you doing in this neighborhood, nigger? What are you doing in my neighborhood? And he points the crowbar at me and he says, you stay right there. And he hits the gas and he peels up the street and turns around. And it's clear he's gonna come up on our side of the street. My friends and I look at each other, we're all in shock when my friend says to me, you better run. And I do, I run directly across the street, uh, cat a corner to where he was coming. And I run all the way up the block and I turn to see where he's at and I can see that he was looking for me on that side of the street and he turned and saw I was up the adjacent block, but he couldn't turn around in time to get to me. And it just so happens where I was at, I was across the street from my home. So I run into my home, apartment building. At that time, my mom was home, my father was a bus operator. So he worked nights, he was there too. And I'm crying, I'm flustered, you can imagine, I'm terrified and I tell them what happened. And I see my father's face get really stern. And he walks into the bedroom and he comes out and he's carrying a revolver. And he looks at me and he says, would you recognize this man if you saw him? I said, absolutely, I would. My father's like, okay, we're gonna go look for him. And my mother grabs his arm and says, Jimmy, what are you going to do? You can't go out there. And my father looking defeated slumps down in his chair. And I'd never seen him that way. And it left me with a few specific impressions. For one, no child should ever be terrified like that. No one should ever face hatred and bigotry in such a clearly violent way who was just walking home. And no one should ever see the look in their father's eyes when they know that they can't defend their child from that kind of thing. And I was very clear in that moment that I wanted to be someone who made sure things like this didn't happen to others. 
And so uh, it was very shortly after that, I saw the play Simple Justice about Brown versus Board of Ed. And I decided I wanted to devote my life to working in professions that really were about combating racism and prejudice. And I can draw a straight line from that experience to what I do today. Thank you, Leotis. Uh, Leora. Thank you, Leotis. And thank you everybody for welcoming me here tonight. Leotis, you, your story makes my heart race. Um, I was also 10 in the 80s. I grew up in Queens with a very different experience. Um, I'm the first American in my family. I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. My parents were born in communist Romania and uh, my older sister was born in Israel. And although we grew up in a very tight knit um, immigrant community in Queens where everybody had accents and all of the elderly aunts and uncles and grandparents had tattoos on their arms, nobody shared their story. I grew up without stories about the past. I was pumped with so much love and promise that this country needs to be revered for the privilege and the freedom it grants that I told my third grade teacher that I wanted to be either a piano teacher or president of the United States. So for me, I, I saw nothing from the past, only such a bright future that it was overwhelming in its positivity. Um, but I also could tell that we were different. My parents had accents. Um, we, money was always scarce. I didn't know that they couldn't afford milk and shoes. Like I didn't know that my grandparents, my mother's parents who were living in Queens, um, how much they all worked together to feed my sister and me. Um, but I just always felt that there was something um, sad, even though no one talked about it. Nobody addressed anything. You know, they would play rummy, smoke cigarettes, eat walnuts that they would crack in the walnut cracker and talk in Hungarian when the children weren't around, but they were not fun conversations. They were talking about the war, but in Hungarian, it's a very difficult language. Um, and then we moved to New Jersey and um, again, I felt very different because again, mine were the only parents with accents that worked all the time. I don't think I saw my dad until I was like 15. Um, I know he loves me. Anyway, um, and uh, when I was in high school and I started to learn about World War II and the Holocaust, it sounds very crazy, but I had to connect dots um, that those tattoos that I saw, the tattoo on my father's father was from Auschwitz and that my father was an only child wasn't by design. And I started this um, group in my high school called the Oral History Holocaust Club, Club, me and a girl a year ahead of me, dear friend to this day. And we started to learn about um, where we came from and we wanted to interview survivors of our high school community to come in. And at the time I had two living grandparents and neither of them would be interviewed. They were like, you don't need to know this. Look forward, look ahead. Um, but I developed a low grade fever. I couldn't, I couldn't ignore this otherness. Um, and while I attended a Jewish high school, um, Again, I felt that there was a minority of this population that was dealing with this um, legacy, but at the time I couldn't even attach the word legacy to it because they, that my grandparents did not talk about it. Um, but I'm quite persistent. And after my first year of college, I came home. By this point, my father's father had passed away and I sat down with my mother's mother, my only living grandparent at the time, and I said, Safta, enough, you have to talk to me. And in her kitchen with a tape recorder, like no iPhones, nothing, she started to tell me her story. And um, 
that's when I understood that history can be told really not just through the textbooks, but through one person. Um, and that lent, 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 pushed me on a relentless path to make up for lost time and find out as much as I can about my family. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, so one thing that both of you are involved in and you started to speak about is that both of you work on anti-prejudice education. You go to explain to them uh, these sorts of issues um, and what they can do about them. Um, and I was wondering, and we've discussed a little of this, you know, outside of the panel, but if you could tell us a little more about how storytelling in particular has played a role in your work uh, in anti-prejudice education and what you feel a story can bring that perhaps other ways of talking about these issues cannot. And I guess, uh, you know, I, I guess I should set up an order. We'll start with Leotis again and we'll just do the same thing. <laughs> sure, I was going to say, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I think it's been, has been clearly established by the stats that Bonnie was speaking about and um, by what all of you have shared on the panel so far, so beautifully. Um, the, status, the statistics and the facts don't get us there. They are insufficient to really have us empathize with another human being. You know, the science tells us today, right? If you read the, the current books and uh, the white papers and the studies, the reports on what people say about uh, emotional commitment, right? And why people believe what they believe and how to convince people it seems that we emotionally commit to something first, and then we seek facts that back up what we already believe. So we're not compelled by facts. And it's occurred to me throughout my life, and certainly as I've been engaging in inclusion work, diversity work, which is so much about getting people to see and recognize themselves in the other, and creating a sense of commonality and recognition of our common and shared humanity and our desire, our goals, our ambitions to actually create a community where we all live together and share in peace, whether that's in an organization, in a neighborhood or in a country. That whenever you're trying to engage someone in those conversations, if you present them with facts, if you present them with figures, they will resist you. They, they don't tend to believe that those things are true, or at least that they're uh, interpreted correctly by Moreover, when you're trying to actually get people to understand experiences, our minds can only hold so much. And when you're trying to actually get people to bridge through different experiences, it's that much farther beyond. There's no way for me right now to completely understand and hold the horrors of what slavery was. There is no way for me to even imagine trying to compare that to the atrocities of the Holocaust. They're not analogs. We can't compare these things. We can't even contain them. But in a story, in one tale, you can actually get to the humanity of someone's experience. One of the reasons why I always start with that story, and I start with that story commonly when I'm doing a lot of diversity training, is because in that moment, you can see that little boy in me, and you can know a lot about who I am and why I do this work. And no matter whether the facts are compelling to you, if you agree or disagree that Black Lives Matter or details about police hypervigilance, you can imagine what it's like to be a boy terrified that some adult's gonna come and beat you with the crowbar and what it's like to have to run home and tell your father that and know that he cannot protect you from this world. And we can all agree that we wanna live in a world where that doesn't happen to children. At least I hope we can. And if we can get to that place of empathy, that's a place to begin conversations about what's it going to take for us to be able to really cooperate and work together to a place where we all get to be free and happy and aspire to the life we imagine. And now to you, Leora. Leotis, I agree 100% with what you said. Um, in looking at the individual story, you cast a spotlight on the individual and that allows you to understand not history with a capital H, but 
the human part of the story. And I think um, whether it's racism, whether it's slavery, whether it's the Holocaust, um, the atrocity is overwhelming, like to, to comprehend the enormous government sanctioned um, atrocity is very hard for me as an adult today to understand, um, let alone try to understand a number like 6 million. What is that? Um, and you don't want to terrify people um, by saying, well, just think of like 600 people in your public school gone tomorrow, right? That's a terrifying tactic. But if you focus on one story and you can understand through that story, what allowed this to take place? And that for me is um, a very important goal as much as it is to remember and honor the struggles that came before me it's to understand that this happened through the government, the lawyers, the engineers, the people in power that allowed for the systematic destruction or the attempted systematic destruction of the Jewish people. And how frightening that is when you understand it wasn't 6 million people wiped out overnight, but it started in the early 1930s. And the war didn't officially start until 1939. And everywhere along the way, rules were put into place that allowed this to happen in a society that elected this person into office and all of the people under him and all of the willing participants and all of the silent bystanders. For me, that is why we start with the story. And um, I, I taught eighth, ninth, and 10th grade literature. And um, every book that I taught, I would ground in um, the history. So if we taught To Kill a Mockingbird, um, I, as much as I wanted my students to understand, um, you know, the themes of the novel, they had to understand what was happening at that time in um, Alabama when this could happen. Um, I'm sure many of you have read To Kill a Mockingbird, so I won't belabor the point, but it's so important that to understand history, you have to see a story, whether it's, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird that somebody wrote and who knows what's real, right? She, she'll never tell us. Um, or we, we studied Night by Elie Wiesel. And again, I had to ground my students in the history, the context of the story, which is the history and that is something that we have to do today more than ever in 2020 is make sure that we don't take anything for granted. So when I think about your opening story, Leotis, that 10 year old boy, that fear, and then compounded by you having to worry about your dad, it's so haunting and it's not long ago. This, this is the eighties. I have like sweatshirts still from the eighties, you know? And um, it's this fear that I have. And some people think I'm obsessed and some people think I'm you know, too concerned, but it's this lack of empathy that allows people to make really big mistakes in the form of silence. So that's what really drives um, me. That's what helped me found um, we do this educational program, which we could talk more about later. And this idea that um, we cannot normalize bigotry or cruelty anywhere, anytime, and it, is, it still affects us today. And the last thing I'll say about this is when my grandmother sat down with me in her kitchen with her like vinyl tablecloth and her perfectly manicured nails, she told me what happened to her mother and her sister when they arrived at Auschwitz. My, my great aunt, who of course I never met, um, was training to be a singer. And her mother, my great grandmother, when they got off the cattle car, they had no idea where they were. They had no idea what was happening. Even though they were Hungarian Jews and the war was raging for already several years, they didn't have news about Auschwitz, right? And um, my great grandmother thought she could protect her daughter 
And she told the officer on her line, because they were sent to the work line, because they were young, right? My grandmother, my great grandmother was probably in her early 40s, and my great aunt was probably 18 or 19. And my great grandmother raised her hand and said in perfect German, my daughter is sick. So they moved her to the gas, the gas chamber line, you know. And it resonated with me that like it's this fear of wanting to protect your children. And you can't, and that's horrible. And I'm a mom now, and I live in this great city, this great country, but I can't deny that this fear is real for me. Um, when my son, who's seven and a half and goes to a Jewish day school, comes out with his yarmulke on, his kippah, I never in my life thought to tell him to take it off until this year. And I live in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Like to me, having that fear is um, very disheartening because I want him to walk proudly on these streets of New York, but I'm very aware that people out there right now don't want to see Jewish people um, living freely. So uh, I take your story very seriously and I take all of this um, as a call to act, not just a call to talk. So Leora, maybe you could talk a little bit more just briefly about We Do, which is this organization that you just mentioned, uh, which relates a lot to what we're talking about here in terms of uh, using stories uh, to educate people about these experiences. Yes, thank you. So 3GNY, which I co-founded um, in 2005 with Daniel Brooks, um, it's an organization for grandchildren of survivors, a forum to discuss like your casually and informally what it's like to be the grandchild of survivors. But all of our social programming were um, for the first five years were had an educational piece, listening from survivors directly, going to exhibits together or off off Broadway plays written by a grandchild grappling with their legacy. And we realized that we really needed to formalize the educational piece of our, our organization. So we created a program called We Do, We Educate. And we were fortunate enough to partner with Facing History and Ourselves, um, where Peter Nelson, who um, was the head of the New York office and now still works with us on We Do, helped us come up with a program where over the course of um, a month, one session a week, grandchildren of survivors learn their family stories and how to share it in classrooms. And um, to date, we have uh, trained over 150 grandchildren of survivors. We've spoken in over 300 schools in the tri-state area. We've reached over 10,000 students. Um, and we come into the class when they've spoken, when they, when they started to learn about the Holocaust. It could be a one day lesson, it could be a three day lesson, it could be to eighth graders, it could be to AP history students. We don't, there's no set curriculum when we come in, we're just invited and um, we share our family story and we try and make it clear that as Peter Nelson says, who's an incredible educator, that the story of survival um, those stories are the exception. And we have to understand that to be able to tell the stories that we're, that we're carrying as these grandchildren um, meant that these people had to overcome horrible, unfathomable losses and struggles and hatred and bigotry. Um, but now today we use that story to help these students, whether they're in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, private school, public school, high school, middle school, that, um, we are responsible for standing up when something doesn't seem right. And we are responsible for saying something. And, um, it, and um, it's through this story that we hope to build the, um, the understanding that one person can change the world. Um, and it's been a, an incredible thing during COVID. Um, we're still working via Zoom into classrooms. So if anyone here has classrooms that you want to invite us to participate in, we'd be more than happy to set that up. Thank you. So just a reminder to everyone, some people may already know this, but uh, if you have questions for our panelists um, or that are just provoked by what we're discussing, 
uh, we have a Q&A function and we have a chat function. And to be honest, they work the same way. Uh, you can put them in there and then uh, Bonnie and Anna are, are, are keeping an eye on that for after we're done with our conversation so that we can just talk about your questions. Um, so I'm gonna flip this back over to Leotis and then to Leora um, uh, to sort of drill down uh, on this uh, story aspect. Because as you hear, Leora uh, helps people learn about the Holocaust through stories. Leotis helps people learn about racism through stories. But the interesting thing about stories is there, you can be tell them very different ways. Uh, and here I'll, I'll put in a little bit about myself. Um, so I was raised with a very intense awareness of anti-Semitism, in particular the Holocaust, because I have uh, three names in Hebrew and the names come from different people who were murdered in the Holocaust. So that's what you're carrying with you. And you know that from a young age, you also then learn that you're missing entire parts of your family, which is not normal. Um, and so, you know, here, here I am, the, you know, the grandson of Holocaust survivors carrying that story, which in some ways is a pessimistic one, in some ways tells you about the sort of depredations of human nature. Um, but on the other hand, um, and those who follow my reporting on anti-Semitism probably notice this, I have a sort of positive outlook despite it all. Uh, and that probably comes from my own family history of why I'm here, which is uh, I am the product of two different people uh, who escaped the Holocaust because other people saved them. Uh, people who were not Jewish, who had every reason not to care uh, and chose to care. Um, and so on my uh, grandmother's side, my grandmother, my mother's mother, um, escaped from Berlin on the last kinder transport, these trains that they sent Jewish children out on uh, to escape Nazi Germany, and they spent the war in England. Um, and my grandmother was one of the, was on the last train and one of the oldest people who actually got on one of those. Uh, that's on her side. On my father's uh, side, uh, his father was a yeshiva student in Poland, uh, and a whole large group of largely yeshiva students were basically running ahead of the Nazis um, as they took over different parts of the area, and they were trying to get out. Um, and they come to this uh, Japanese consulate in Polish Lithuania, uh, and the Japanese consul's name was Sugihara. Um, and J Japan was, of course, allied with, uh, with the uh, Nazis. And so uh, they asked this guy, stamp our visa so we can go uh, to Japan, we can get out of Europe, and we can hopefully survive this war uh, and maybe get from Japan elsewhere. Uh, and the government told Sugihara, you know, don't do this. And Sugihara stamped, you know, thousands of visas and saved so many people's lives. And one of them was my grandfather. Uh, so I grow up on the one hand knowing how, you know, the depredations of human nature. I also know that I'm only here because people did something else. People chose to act differently, uh, even when it might have been extraordinarily difficult. Um, which is to say that there are optimistic narratives and pessimistic narratives we can tell uh, about the experiences of prejudice. Um, and they're both important. You can't leave one out and you only tell one uh, and not the other. If you only tell the positive ones, you're looking through it like a Hollywood sepia tone lenses and it's all in the rear view mirror. That's just not how it is. Um, but if you, of course, you only tell the pessimistic one, you can feel like there's nothing worth fighting for and you can't win. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to you as both of you as professionals and starting with Leotis who do this regularly, how do you balance those two stories? Thank you, Yair, for sharing that story. I think that um, as I listen to you and as I listen to Leora, what I'm most present to is just the power of the story. And I could say that for myself, I use it in the way that is going to connect. You know, I think that what's there for me as I listen to Leora tell the story about how it was for her growing up and her parents sharing with her, um, looking optimistically toward her life here in the United States, looking expectantly toward a future that she could have. And I contrast that with my experience of my father telling me, you know, be very wary of the neighborhood that we're in, be cautious um, that, you know, as a black man, um, you will not have the same level of respect. You will as much. I think that what both of our parents were trying to do is do their best to prepare us for the world they thought we were going to experience. And, um, you know, whether or not either one of those is the right or wrong way, who is to say? But the, the fact is, right, the desire to transmit the experience from one generation to the next and create for us the future that we're going to be living into is a very powerful thing. And, 
you know, it, it makes me think, Leroy, the, the amazing work that you do at We Do. Like what, I, what I'm so Im impressed by, what I think is so important about it is that as we talk about the, the sort of positive um, transmittal of stories across generations, I think we also have to remember that um, the negative stories, right, the stories of hate also get transmitted. You know, I, I always remind people when I'm, when I'm doing um, diversity training that, you know, uh, slaveholders were defeated in the Civil War, but slavery wasn't. The idea that slavery was right is not an idea that was defeated. The people who actually had the power to implement that were defeated. It's a very different thing. And I think, though again, not to draw analogs, but I think the same when I think about the Holocaust, right? And Nazis, the state was defeated, but the idea was not. And we see today that these ideas lived on. They were transmitted from generation to generation. And we know that it wasn't just the facts. They didn't just hand them sheets and say, hate black people, hate Jewish people. They told stories. And so these stories, the hate that gets transmitted from generation to generation is living in these stories. And if there's a way that we are gonna get to a point where we as human beings get past this, we will need to transform those stories. We will need to have people learn new stories that have them understand empathetically other people's experiences, our experiences, both the positive and the negative, the ones that we love this country for and the ones that make us fearful of it and make it hard for us to be at ease and to have a sense that we belong. And somehow in all of those stories, we have to collectively find a way for us to move forward as one people. And so I think because we are not just one or the other, all of our stories, the positive and the negative matter, and we need to find our own stories and tell them in ways that are gonna connect us to the person we're speaking to, no matter who they are or where they are, as best we can. Um, it's funny, I think we're both trying to be so careful not to draw comparisons, which is so right on. As Anna said, it's not the oppression Olympics, I think that was her term. Um, but even listening to you, I'm so struck by so many, it, it's, it's so clear to me that it's coming from the same place, you know. Um, initially, I, when I started to speak tonight, I said I grew up without stories. But now as an adult, I know my family's story. And um, I had to excavate these different lives. Um, and the only way I could do it was by starting with the positive. For me to get my, my own family to speak, grandmother, great uncles, I had to ask them about their beautiful life before the war. And that's very important when we talk to the students to make them understand that um, even though it was so many decades ago in a country that most of these kids can't even identify in a map, like if you say Poland, Romania, Germany, they don't know, you know, um, we have to make it relatable. So um, we start with the positive. And that's also because in order to explain the devastating reality of the Holocaust, it has to, have, we have to make clear what they lost. Um, I had the privilege last week of interviewing um, my 92 year old uncle David, uh, who was always the youngest of my father's um, survivor relatives. And now he's the only, he finally agreed to speak with me because he went back to Auschwitz for the 75th um, liberation January pre-COVID. And um, his 72 year old fiance inspired him to finally speak to me. And um, in, in, in talking to him, I started with, what was your life like before the war? And he told me these gorgeous, rich stories. He was one of 12 children. And um, yes, they had no electricity. And yes, they, I mean, all of these things that, you know, for us sound like, how could you live without a bathroom or like a proper, you know? Um, he painted such a beautiful life that when we got to the awful part, you know, when the laws changed and he was no he was an apprentice in a wood, in a wood, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, in a woodworking, oh my goodness. In a woodworking, um, as a woodworker. Um, 
he was not allowed to hold a, ha a hammer um, because if a non-Jew saw him holding a hammer, that was illegal because a Jewish boy or a Jewish person wouldn't be, wouldn't be allowed to have that privilege of learning um, a craft. Um, and from there, it was like one law at a time, one year at a time, his, his civil liberties were taken away. And then we get to the heart of the story when he's taken to Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz and um, an incredible tale of survival. Um, he was a 16 year old boy, very skinny, constantly tried to make himself look taller and meatier to be chosen for work, be chosen for work. And he ultimately does survive. Um, but it's balancing the story of the positive and the negative. When I had to dig into my grandparents' history, um, there was no good person in those stories. I, I, what you say, what you said, Yair, I understand very much the, the kind acts of those individuals that did save your grandparents. Um, unfortunately, my father's parents survived Auschwitz because the war ended like, and they were liberated. Um, so obviously the good people are the liberators, right? My mother's mother survived um, Lichtenworth, a camp that the history books have reduced to a footnote. 2000 G Jews were interned there, maybe 200 survived. She was one of those 200. Um, and my mother's father um, was in a Soviet labor camp. And, and my name, I'm Leora Ariella, I'm named for my mother's uh, grandfather, who, um, although he survived the war, he never survived the prison that he was in um, post-war because of Jewish underground activities he was participating in. So when his only daughter, the only survivor, um, was liberated from her camp, she was very sick with um, typhus and she had to recuperate with the Russians before she could even walk to get the information to find where her father was. But when she got there, he was already dead. So you have to focus on the pre-war then you talk about the war and then you talk about the lives they were able to build after. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I, discovered that both of my grandfathers were married and fathers before the war. But if, if I tell you how much information I had to like, how many people I had to ask, I had to email a cousin in Canada, a cousin in Israel, a cousin in, um, in uh, Chile to get this information that I would have had an uncle on my father's side, but the Nazis killed him in front of my grandfather. But my grandfather never told anybody. He, they, couldn't, they couldn't speak these horrors. So now I feel it is incredibly urgent that um, we speak these horrors with the positive lens of we won't do this. We won't allow society to do this because we are society. You know, it's not them. It's not they did this. It's we. Um, so that's how I balance the positive with the negative. Thank you, Leora. Um, so I talked a little bit about the origins of my name. Leora just talked a little bit about the origins of hers. I cannot resist uh, asking Leotis, uh, this is a good story, the origins of his name. Yeah, um, yeah, stories vary is what I'll <laughs> preface this by saying. Um, so my name, Leotis, uh, comes from a childhood friend of my father's who uh, was named Otis Lee. And uh, I remember when uh, I got curious at a young age about my, my name, asking my father, you know, who was this person? He was like, oh, it was you know, the person I knew in school. I was like, oh, must have been a close friend. No, not really. Something about the name must have had a profound effect on you. I just thought it was an interesting name. So, not always is there a significant story behind everything with what I say, but um, uh, you know, you sort of empower it with what you bring to it. Uh, and so I've come to really love my name and its distinctness and its uniqueness 
and that it kind of came from nothing but my father's imagination. Thank you very much. I think it's very important when we discuss topics like these that sometimes we just pause and laugh a little bit because uh, otherwise it can get very dark very quickly. Um, and speaking of things that are a little bit harder or difficult to discuss, um, one of the things you just said, Leotis, is to how these stories, they reverberate down the generations. And uh, some of them are good stories and some of them are not. Um, and I'm curious, both of you, and I guess we'll again start with Leotis, um, if there are any stories out there that are told about your community that you'd like to change um, uh, or you'd like to help uh, other people um, outside, uh, you know, that you'd like to change or you wish, frankly, they'd go away. Yeah, I always, um, you know, I think about the fact that my mother's great grandmother, uh, so my great great grandmother, uh, was born into slavery. Um, so um, her daughter, my mother's grandmother, uh, was born just after slavery. Um, and so she remembers at a very young age working on the plantation, because even though uh, folks were free. There weren't a lot of opportunities necessarily, right? So um, my mother tells a story about how she was, uh, my mother's grandmother was working in uh, the master's kitchen. Uh, and of course, you weren't able to eat the food that you prepared. So she was preparing for the plantation owners. Uh, and she prepared these very delicious crab cakes and was very hungry. And um, she took a bite of a crab cake and put it underneath a chair so that uh, no one would know and was chewing on it. It just so happened that this uh, family had a parrot and the parrot actually told on my grandmother um, in the racist way that the parrot had been trained to say whenever uh, someone who was a slave or formerly a slave had done something they weren't supposed to. And uh, the man of the house grabbed my great grandmother and choked her until the crab cake came out. And when you think about that level of hate for a child, for another human being, I think that, you know, the myth that I would really like to see dispelled about so much of this is that racism is a black problem. Right, that police hypervigilance is a black problem, that poverty or prison is a black problem. I think when you look at these things, like when I look at the horrors or consider the atrocities of the Holocaust, these are clearly human problems. There's something that is dysfunctional and damaged in the human spirit that allows people to treat others this way. When we look at so many things happening in the country today, it is clear, these are not issues that just impact one community. It is not as if these things are isolated and only one group is harmed. So much of these things, as intersectionality teaches us, are interlocking, right? The oppressions really do go together. I think um, the alliance in history that has been there between the Black and Jewish communities is kind of recognition of this from early on. And I think now we see it um, in homophobia, we see it in misogyny, um, we see it in anti-immigrant bias. There's so many things here where these mentalities are really sort of a, a sort of illness of the spirit. And I think that, you know, when you think that it's someone else's problem, if I allow myself to believe that anti-Semitism is only a problem for Jews and doesn't affect me as a Black man, then there's some way in which I'm distanced from it. I don't have to be as concerned. I've got my own problems. Maybe, you know, that's something that really has nothing to do with me or that I can do anything about. But when I really get clear that this is a human problem, that if someone is out there hating Jews, they're hating me, right? That this is actually a damaged thing that we have to heal as human beings. And that my stake is that if we're gonna move as one human community together, we've all got to see each other as human beings, then that break in humanity is something that I have a definite investment in for my own future and the future for those that I love, no matter who they are. And so I think the thing that I really want to dispel is the idea 
that when you hear or see something or hear a story about someone, it's not like, oh, I feel bad for them. I encourage you to think, I feel bad for us. There is something that we must do to heal this. We cannot live in the world. We will not survive as a people if hate like what we see today and what we've seen in the past is allowed to continue. Absolutely. It, it makes me think of a, another small story about my son. He recently learned to read and we were walking on the street and he saw um, like chalk that said Black Lives um, Matter. And then we saw a t-shirt that said Black Lives Matter. And he looked to me, he's like, well, of course Black Lives Matter. Why are people writing that? And I was like, oh, I love you. And I love the school you go to. Um, it was so innocent in his like confusion. Um, and I think what you said, um, it's a human problem. It's a, it's, I feel so bad for all of us that this can go on. Um, and I don't have to look to World War II and the Holocaust. I don't have to look to slavery. I mean, my husband is French. Um, he grew up in Strasbourg, which is on the border of Germany. And um, in 2000 and, uh, so 13, I believe, um, my sister-in-law, his older sister was like vice principal of a Jewish day school in Toulouse, France. And um, every day she drove her two children to school as well as the main principal's daughter. And on one particular morning, um, as they were arriving to school, a man on a motorcycle drove past the school and shot innocent children, including the principal's daughter. Um, and my, my nephew now is in college and my niece is now in high school, but um, they saw firsthand terrorism against Jewish people in the 21st century in their school. And I'm, I'm hoping many of you know about this horrible incident in Toulouse in the Jewish day school. Um, my niece and nephew, of course, my sister-in-law as well, of course, the people who lost their children, they've all been irreparably changed because of this horrible, horrible incident that happened eight years ago. Um, and to think what happened even this past month in France, you know, beheading a teacher. I mean, this is a human problem. Um, the teacher that was beheaded was not Jewish, was not black, was a human. Um, and um, I think about how my father-in-law was a little boy during World War II and he, he hid in plain sight. Um, he, his mom and his sister, travel from town to town. And my husband is an artist. My father-in-law is a doctor, also an artist. And he presented me in the last couple of years with a paper mache, um, a beautiful paper mache uh, sculpture, I guess you could say. And what is it? It's him as a little boy, a Nazi's hand on his head affectionately, like not knowing that he was a Jewish little boy and his very um, elegantly dressed mother. Um, and it was some kind of moment that I have to get more clarity about, but my, my little daughter, she's six. She said to me, mommy, what is this story? What, what is this? And I was like, uh, can we just put a pause button on this question and I'll answer you in six to seven years because I'm not ready to share that with them. But at the same time, um, if we don't cultivate a sensitivity like my older son at seven and a half has with mommy, why are they wearing Black Lives Matter? Of course it matters, you know? Um, it's, a, it's a tricky balance that we have to teach them from go that this is our world and we make it what it is. Um, but we don't wanna terrify them. And I do credit my grandparents for trying to protect my sister and me. I have a much younger brother who grew up quite differently, like the silence had been shattered at that point. 
but um, silence doesn't work. It just doesn't. Okay. Um, it's amazing because we're, we're actually running out of time, um, which, you know, it doesn't feel like it um, because when you're telling a story, you get caught up in the story. Um, I'm going to actually um, flip it to questions because uh, we've got a few already come in from the audience. We want to make sure we get to them. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to, we thought maybe we'd have Bonnie or Anna do it, but I think it makes it more sense just to keep it going in the flow. And I will read some of these to you and editorialize a, a little bit. Um, so uh, we've got one question about uh, the private sector and corporate responses to bigotry. I, I think we've all seen uh, uh, how uh, different responses in, in that area to some such like, you know, Gushers, uh, the candy brand tweeting, uh, uh, Gushers would not be Gushers without the black community, which I guess is something is probably better than Gushers uh, don't see color only flavor, you know, could have been worse. Uh, and then you see more substantial things like uh, people donating uh, a little, uh, you know, money here and there to different causes or trying to do certain things in their own workplace. And so uh, I'm curious, uh, I'll start with you, Leotis, and then Leotis, if you'd like to chime in, I feel like this is a little bit uh, uh, too Leotis, that's certainly how it was directed in the Q&A, um, how you feel uh, the, the private sector corporations could deal with this productively uh, or, you know, or unproductively if there are things that you see that you think could be better. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm really fascinated by this moment as a civil rights and diversity and inclusion professional watching how corporations are engaging with this. And I think what you, you're starting to see is really this kind of change in terms of where people are looking to apply pressure to create social change. And for so long, right, this was directed at the government and people looked at institutions and you know, for reasons of which we could all opine, people no longer see government as being a place, at least certainly not the only place that could bring about transformative change or justice. And what they know is they're like, well, well government's responsive to organizations, right? You, the power of corporations to be people means that you now actually have the ability to influence the law. And so people are recognizing that organizations are made up of people. And if you want to see a different world, you have the opportunity to elevate your voice and say, we're demanding you to say something. And organizations realize, you know, whether or not they're motivated by their values or their stock price or their brand reputation, there is an obligation and an expectancy that they must say something. They must do something. And you can see on a range, you know, folks being very, very tepid about, you know, putting out Black Lives Matter. Um, which for them may be very sort of out there in the skinny branches. Certainly, I think most organizations, even a year ago, wouldn't have dared put Black Lives Matter on their website. But you see them starting to wade into the idea of saying that different communities' voices matter, that we empathize, and we, we see the value of these folks, not only for our employees, but also for our customers and our community members, and we think it's important. And then on the opposite extreme, you see folks really making taking this opportunity to make a stand. I was uh, struck by Ben and Jerry's, we must dismantle white supremacy, which is no matter how you feel about it, a stake in the ground about an organization, right? It's saying, this is what we think. This is how we feel. And if this makes you not wanna buy our products, we're willing to deal with that. And I think that part of what's going to have us break through the time that we're in, the sort of loggerheads that we're in, is all of us creating a personal stake in these conversations. And I'm excited and I'm enthusiastic to have people not let corporations get off the hook. You know, as, as much, and I get the different arguments about cancel culture and people, you know, not wanting to, to, to necessarily see accountability be doled out the way that it always is. The idea that if you are a corporation, you benefit off of labor, benefit off of patronage, and that obligates you to do something when something is happening to these communities is an idea that I think is long past due. And I think all of us wrestling with that, corporations included, there's this explosion of d &I professionals now, I think will shape the conversations we see you know, no matter what happens on November 3rd in the years to come. So, and then here's another question that I, I think is applies to both of you. We'll start with Leora on this one. Um, 
So uh, Frederica writes, this is a pretty intense question. I'm going to generalize it a little bit, um, but sort of how do one relates, uh, um, she writes that she's a black Puerto Rican woman who recently ended a relationship with uh, her brother over anti-Semitism. And uh, she asked, how do you relate? Have you ever felt the need to end a relationship? And I would add, how, how just in general, do you relate to someone either within a family circle or a close social circle uh, who perhaps has these sorts of views um, as you guys have experienced educators, what would be you know, the way you would approach such a situation? Thank you for that question. And I'm sorry for that situation that you're in. Um, I will say that the most anti-Semitic um, remarks that I've heard directed towards me um, were always said um, when people didn't know I was Jewish. So they thought we were complicit in this feeling. When I got to college, I left my very sheltered, homogeneous Jewish world, and I, um, I, I couldn't believe that in my first week at Penn, which has a very strong Jewish population, I heard probably four anti-Semitic comments made um, in my presence because they didn't know I was Jewish. So things as simple and as devastating as, oh yeah, you know, the Jews buy their way into this university. Or, um, I, I mean, when I said that, when I heard that, I was like, um, I, I, I'm, I'm Jewish. Um, it wasn't because I was brave, it's because I was shocked. And the comment that followed was, oh, really? You're too busy, you're too pretty to be a Jew. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening? You know, I was 17 years old and I was just amazed by this. And it kept on going, you know? So I think that, um, people sometimes don't understand what they're saying. And sometimes people are um, parroting what they hear at home. And um, a conversation is the best place to start between you and your brother, the person that's asking the question. I'm sorry, I, think, I don't remember the name. Um, and I think um, there has to be a, a more nuanced approach um, with larger organizations, institutions, universities, especially even now. I mean, I graduated 25 years ago um, where we can't allow people to refashion, you know, Zionism as colonialism. We can't allow people to feel bad for being pro-Israel. We can't allow for there to be, um, uh, I mean, just this past month in New York, um, New York City Council can, council member candidates were asked to sign a, a questionnaire or a petition or a pledge that if elected, they would not visit Israel. Um, what is that? Like that has to be addressed and that can't just come from the people that won't sign it. That's trying to put into law something that is um, deeply dangerous to our society. So I think, um, conversation, directness, but also education. You have to know the facts and people are very good at quoting what they think they heard is right and sound bites in our Twitter aged lives. Um, but that really uh, is not enough. We need to really dive into the facts and learn what the issues are before uh, making dangerous judgments and uh, racist and bigoted comments that really can affect the individual and the community at large. So Leotis, if you'd like to address the question, you can address it. There's a, there's a lot we could unpack with that answer there, but we are running out of time. But if Leotis, you'd like to address the question, and the question was also about, I think, uh, how you deal with somebody, whether they're expressing anti-Semitism or racism or another form of bigotry in, who is close to you. But this is a very hard sort of situation. I think not, you know, I think I can't speak for everyone, but I think we've all had that that experience and how do you approach it? And I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, I think Leora did a great job, so I'll be brief, but I'll say that um, I think that we really uh, have to put at stake the relationships that we have with people when it comes to intolerance. Uh, I will say over the past couple of years, I've lost a lot of close relationships with folks. And I think that basically, you know, you can disagree about politics, you can disagree um, about points of view, or maybe to some degree even readings of history, but you, you cannot disagree about values and remain a cohesive whole in relationship. 
I think. Um, I think if you're talking about the value of the lives of human beings and you substantively agree, then in conscience, um, I cannot remain close to you. And I think we can try as much as we can telling um, and to share with people our helpful points of view. But I think if we get to the point where we recognize that we have different values, at least for me, it's time to reconsider that relationship. Okay. Um, so I know that uh, uh, Bonnie and Anna have a, slow, a brief closing to talk to you a little bit about uh, who brought us all together, the new crack of Friendship Society. Um, but first, I just want to thank both of you very, very much we, uh, for your we time, have time tonight. I'm sorry, we have time for one more question. One yep. more question. Well, I have a closing one. question. I, you know, I was worried that I couldn't ask it. The closing question is really just an open mic to both of you, which is to say you have an audience here who came and sat with us for a significant period of time in the evening uh, to talk about these issues. Is there anything we haven't covered, we haven't talked about that you'd like to leave them with tonight? Um, and we'll start with you, Leora, and then Leotis can have the last word. Um, first thing, I have enormous gratitude that all of you came out tonight. Um, it's really amazing that with so much going on in the world to keep track of that you carved out time in your lives to participate tonight. So thank you. And secondly, I would just encourage each of you to speak up when you see something or hear something. Um, it's very hard when the relationships are close and personal, but um, you have to have a, like, a, there's a no bully policy, a no tolerance for bullying in schools. There has to be a no tolerance for bigotry. Um, even if it's a stupid joke, um, you can't, it's not funny anymore. It's just not, it's dangerous. It allows for a culture of acceptance. Um, it, it, it's just not okay. And the more we all do that, the easier it is, you know, um, you, somebody like me, somebody like Leotis, we could run the risk of alienating ourselves from normal discourse and like just drinking a beer with friends because I think we are hypersensitive um, to, our, to our family stories and our desire for things to get better. So it really should be the work of the individual all the time. Like if somebody makes that comment that might sound funny, it's, you have to stop it. And that's really, really hard to do. So um, empower yourself by knowing it's the right thing to do is to say something. And um, just recently, one of our WeDo participants was in a class um, and after she told her grandmother's story of survival, um, a 18 year old boy um, raised his hand during the Q and A and said, uh, do you feel guilty about being Jewish? And it took her a minute to like understand what the intent of his question was. And she said, oh, because um, Jews control the weather and own the banks. And he was like, yeah. And she was so awesome because it wasn't his fault that he had that question, right? That's what he had absorbed in his upbringing or in his community. And she said, first of all, we don't control the weather because it's raining again and I hate the rain. And then she said, we also don't, um, control the banks, but she couldn't get into it more than that, you know, in, in, in the limited time that she had. But the, I think the important thing is allowing younger people to say what's on their mind, because a lot of people get scared to not use the right vocabulary and not um, call people by the right capital letter, or you know what I mean? So I think that if we do, on the one hand, I'm saying be vigilant. And on the other hand, I'm saying, allow for there to be conversation, allow for people to say, oh wait, you're Jewish and you don't have horns? Like I almost passed out when I heard that, like when I was uh, in college, I was like, no, I don't have horns, you know? But that's what that person had grown up thinking. And had I walked away in a huff, we wouldn't have um, clarified that miscommunication, however shocking and painful it was, as it was, you, you got to talk through it. That's what I'm trying to say. So thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs> and I will uh, build off of what Leora just shared, not to uh, contradict what I was just saying about, um, you know, reconsidering relationships, but to complicate it. 
I think that while you may reconsider a relationship, I think it is always important to uh, not take your love away from someone. I think even if you disagree, um, it is important to leave room for there to be peace, to leave room for there to be reconciliation. It is self-evident that we will not hate our way to a better future. Um, and as history has shown us, if you just defeat the other side, resentments linger. No one's going to beat the other side to a better future, whatever they consider that to be. So no matter what, what I request you take away from all the stories tonight is that we have to find a way to share and connect. We have to find a way for there to be peace and reconciliation. We have to find a way to get to empathy and understanding across all of our vast chasm-like disagreements. We must still remember that over there, even if they're beyond where we can see, is another human being. And that's got to be where we begin and where we end in all of our disagreements. And thank you for allowing us to be with you tonight. Thank you both so very much. I can't think of a better note to end on. And so I will now pass it back to our hosts for a very brief word before we close it for the night. Thank you again. Hello, everyone. I just would like to close today with a quote from the great poet Maya Angelou, who said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And it is our sincerest hope that we made you feel something today and that this glimpse into the lives and point of view of our panelists serves as a motivation for all of us to become active participants in creating a world that is safer for everybody. If you like today's programming, please consider making a donation to the New Krakow Friendship Society. Proceeds from today will be going to the We Do, We Educate program so we can raise the next generation to be upstanders. On behalf of myself, Bonnie, and the whole of the New Krakow Friendship Society, thank you, Yair, for facilitating and guiding us today. To Leotis and Leora, thank you for your openness and vulnerability. Thank you to Michelle and Jithin from Deloitte for lending us your time and expertise. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Good night. Good night.